Hello, everyone. Hi. Before we start, I just want to say I've been waiting for this for five years. I'm very, very excited to be up here talking to you all. So thank you all for coming. It's really something I've been waiting a long time for. Thank you. All right, now the real stuff. Uh, so those of you that don't know me, um, my name is Lou Della Para. I'm a engineering lead and a product owner at Claris. Um, I run the infrastructure team uh, for both Studio, previously for Connect. Um, I'm excited and proud to be with you today to talk about how Connect, combined with FileMaker and Studio, can help reduce integration complexity. Just to start out, so I know where everyone is, I want to ask a couple questions. Who here has used Claris Connect before? Pretty good, pretty good. Who here is integrated with a RESTful API? Who's got an active flow in Connect in production now? Cool. Okay. So a lot of people used it, not a lot of people are actually using it in active flow. Cool. It's very good to know. Who here hates when the presenter pings the crowd? <laughs> There's one. Cool. Cool. So let's start out with what you're going to learn today. I've got a couple of things that I'd like to get across. Uh, first and foremost, we'll see how by moving integrations to Connect, FileMaker applications can be made simpler and thus easier to deploy between environments. We'll see how once integration logic is abstracted to Connect, uh, we can improve FileMaker and thus third-party deployments, as well as credential security. We'll also review custom connectors that will enable developers to define connectors for any RESTful API using either static API keys or the OAuth2 format. Finally, we'll put everything together and show how using Connect, FileMaker, and Claire Studio work as a unified platform. So uh, just to get started, I, I saw there was a lot of people that actually haven't used it. We're going to do a, a high-level overview of Connect, kind of find out the groundwork, see where everything is, and then we'll go and jump into something fun. We'll do a demo. OK. So here I have the homepage of Claris Connect. First thing I'd point out in the top left corner here is my team. My team's Claris Engage 2024. Just to the right of that, there's a little carrot, down carrot there, that allows them to switch between teams. It's quite common for you to have more than one team. If you need to move back and forth, that's the area to do it. Just to the right of that is our ellipses, three dots. Um, that has some team options. If you need to invite someone to your team, if you need to add the on-prem agent, and then very importantly, you have some subscription information, how many active flows you have, and how many monthly steps you've used to date. Just beneath that area, we have the project rectangles. Each one of these things are a project. You can think of project as a container. The project holds your flows that are either enabled or disabled. It'll hold your flow execution. We'll see that later on. And most importantly, to hold your app connections, right? The, the credentials and the security that you use in order to connect to those third-party APIs. Part one. If I dive into a project here, like this silos to workflows project, on the left-hand side, you see I've got my flows. I've got the approvals pane. We'll see what an approval looks like uh, later on in the session. I've got the all-important webhooks, which allow me to define uh, RESTful endpoints, APIs, if you will. Um, that go into Claris Connect and eventually out of Claris Connect for a round trip to create an API. And then also the sharing tab. So if you already have someone on your team, they don't have access to a project, you want to share it to them, that's where you'd go to share it. Moving then just to the right, you've got your flows tab, which is what you see here. I'm currently on it. And that holds each individual flow within your project. To the right of that is a switch with some options that allows you to either enable or disable a flow or edit flow options, things like update the name, um, so on and so forth. Just to the right of that is your flow history. Um, one of the great things about Connect, and we're going to go into this in detail later on, is that it, it will automatically, if you allow it, uh, save your execution history for every flow within your project, and then within each flow, every action. And so you automatically get the inputs and outputs of each action without having to do any development work. It's one of the really cool features of the platform. We'll talk about that in depth later on. And then you also have your app connections. Those are the connections for the flows that you use in the project. In this case, I've got a Calendly account, because I've integrated with Calendly. I've got a custom connector autopilot account. And I've got my studio uh, development and then production account, as well as a FileMaker server admin account and a development FileMaker, uh, FileMaker uh, data API account, Jamf, and one roster. 
One thing we'll note about a project, this is really interesting, really important to know as you, as you get going, is that the app connections that you save are usable by any flow within a project. So if you've got a bunch of flows that are gonna be using one type of connection, you generally wanna group them into a project so that you can share that connection across the board. Later on in the session, I'm gonna get into how you can actually use connects to move between environments. The grouping of the app connections in the project and being able to configure them on or off or reconnect them is gonna be important for that. So as you start to develop, as you start to work with Claris Connect and as you start to develop flows, think of your projects as a container for both your connections and then the flows that you wanna execute. Awesome, so all right, we've got the groundwork done. We we've, we've have now kind of a, a lay of the land. Let's do something fun, let's get into a demo. Okay. Here I've got a studio calendar, and it's beautiful. It's a nice web calendar. Um, I can use it to manage my schedule. I can even share it with my team, have the, allow them to see their own schedule or my schedule and their schedule at the same time. But there's not really anything there, right? I don't actually have the most meaningful part of my calendar, which is the events of the calendar. For me, I use Calendly to help manage my time. I can create a link, say I'm available from say nine to five, and then allow someone with the link to schedule a time that best meets them. Makes it really easy to collaborate, really easy to schedule things without going into detail. I can use Claris Connect to populate this calendar and I really give the calendar meaning. To do this, I'm gonna head over to Calendly. This is a, a Calendly calendar that I've created. This is the link that you would give someone. Um, and I'll just pick a time that I'd like to reserve. In this case, I'll pick uh, February 8th at 2 p.m. I'll choose next. I'll put in my name, my email address, and choose to schedule the event. Oh, it's not available. I'm not gonna go at that time. I'll go at another time. I get it, I respect the calendar. Perfect, it liked that one. Now, if I go into Clara Studio and give the calendar a quick refresh, if all goes well, I should see that event automatically in my calendar without really any development work. There it is. It's rather long, but there it goes. Let's take a look at the flow that enabled that to work. So this flow, uh, which again, uses my Calendly, um, uses my Calendly account and my uh, Studio account, uh, starts with a trigger, which is the very first option. In this case, when an event is created in Calendly, um, I then use a logical step within Connect, which is an if statement, to say if there's a new invitee created, so this is a new, new event, I'm going to get some information about my studio calendar, the data sheet, what, what we know in, in FileMaker as a table. Then, because it never works out that one system has the same format as another system, we know that that's a common problem. In fact, a lot of the integration logic that we do is to move data from one type to another or, or massage it in a way that is better for my FileMaker or my studio system. I'm gonna use the built-in text utility in Connect to transform some of the information. And then finally, I'm gonna create the calendar event uh, inside of Studio, right? So that entire integration, completely done in Connect, all done with just this one flow. And you might think, okay, wait a minute, that's cool for a new event, right? That's cool for if I wanted to share a calendar and then from that point on, once the integration is enabled, I've got, I've got my calendar, but what about all the stuff previous, right? What about all the stuff that I had last month, right? Or maybe yesterday that, that was booked, necessarily represented in my Studio calendar. For that, I've got another flow. This flow is a little bit different. Rather than use the Calendly trigger, I'm using the Connect Schedule trigger to automatically go through and pull the dates for my, for my Calendly events and then put them into uh, my Studio Calendar. So here, I've got the Custom Advanced, right, which is essentially just saying, hey, I'm gonna use a cron string, because I like cron, who doesn't? Um, and then I'm going to get the table definition like we saw earlier. I'm gonna list out the events inside of Calendly and then use Connect's looping utility, which we call the repeat, to go through and for each calendar invite that's found, I'm gonna create a studio record. Let's run this and while we're running it, we'll jump into some of the flow history, we'll see what it looks like. Hopefully by the time we're done, we have a bunch of events inside the studio calendar. Oh, I'll choose run there It popped over to the uh, flow tab. You'll see that I now have a flow that is pending, right? It's like sync all events. While it's pending, let's hop into the flow history and talk about some of the things you can do there. So when I tap on this, I can see, okay, well, my flow actually 
went kind of fast. Uh, not only can I see that the flow itself was successful, but the flow history gives me each individual step, its status, whether there was an error or whether there was uh, a success. But then even more than that, I can go into each individual action and I automatically get the request, the input, and the response, the output, for each individual action. So for the trigger here, if I choose my request, I can see, okay, it was a standard trigger. There's not much information there. We'll see this more robust later on. The response was run on demand because I clicked the button. It was true. And a status code of 204. Anybody's worked with APIs before, the status codes are really important. I will be very, very simple here to say anything between a 2 and a 299 is generally successful, right? Anything 300 and above to about 400 is, hey, go somewhere else. And then 400 after that is something went wrong and it was your fault. Anything 500 and above is something went wrong and it's my fault, right? <laughs> um, Moving on from there with my 204, I'll go to my table definition, and now we can see, okay, well, I made a request to get all my entities, right? So I have that information. Uh, I have what the calendar event looks like. And my response, I see, okay, well, I've, here's all the sheets that I have. My reoccurring appointment, my activity, my campaign response, all the things that I've been tracking inside of Studio. Moving on from there, I'll then list all my Calendly events, and this is where it gets sort of interesting. Uh, the uh, Calendly step here will give me back a response of uh, my data in a collection, which is an array. For each one of this array, you'll see um, Connect has already indicated that there's 18 total items with 13 items into it. What that means is I've got 18 total events with 13 properties in it, 13 fields, if you will. Um, and I can easily go through each individual one and see what they would look like. From there, I will then move down to the repeat field and you'll see that, okay, what the repeat field does is it took that array that I had earlier, that, that collection, um, and it's going to go through each individual one and then perform an action based on it. That action is what I added that allowed me to create the uh, studio event. So I have my response here. And then finally, last but not least, we'll get another transform. I'm not going to show it here. It's way more interesting to see it on the other side. So bear with me a second. And then finally, we'll create the record for each individual one. So now we've iterated through all my Calendly events, in this case for the month, and went back and actually added them in my calendar. So with this, I have pretty much the whole round trip. I can get all the events that were scheduled before I enabled my flow, and then with the first flow that I showed you, I have all the events moving forward. Anytime anyone schedules an event with me, my uh, Connect flow will trigger, and it'll create a uh, Studio calendar event. Let's head back to Studio, and I'll give it a refresh. If all goes well, we should see a whole bunch of events. Perfect. Now I have all my events uh, automatically iterated through. Um, from here, if I need to update it, I can go through, run it again. I'll get the same information. Or I can wait for someone to go through and, and, um, and assign another event. Uh, last but not least, what we'll do is actually go through and see what that transform looked like. This is a really powerful feature within, within Connect. So here I'm back in what's called the editing view of the flow. This allows me to make changes within my flow if I wanted to. And the reason I did that is because I want to show you what's, what we call step data. Um, step data we saw in the history as the JSON that we were looking through, but in the edit mode, that it actually allows us to configure it and select the things that we need. Now, as we all know, and as I mentioned earlier, the format of the data is very rarely in the format that matches my system. I don't have control over the way that Calendly is going to define their event. I do have control of my schema, but I need a way to merge them together. And that's where a lot of the integration logic that we do um, comes from, right? And generally, we handle that in Podmaker scripts today. If you offload that into uh, Connect, we get a really easy way to see both what the transformation would look like and then also easily logging for later on so we can debug or enhance as we need. Okay. So I've got my transform start time here, uh, and I've got some step data, some fields. And in this case, I want to take some text. I'm going to replace the 00.00z, and I'll make it the simplified 00z, right? Make it into a format that, that Studio knows. One of the great parts about step data is you can actually go through and, after it's executed, uh, get a representation of that data, and then go through and change it. So if you notice when I click this, uh, three lines and a plus here, I have each individual step in the order that they were executed in the flow. For my case, I want to transform each record as I have it. So I'll use the repeat option here, 
And you'll see that now I have that same JSON that we saw earlier, but it's selectable. It's a little bit easier, a little bit easier visually to select it. If you notice as I hover over calendar event, it allows me to select that. Um, if I were to go down to say the created at or the end time, it'll show that. This particular case, it's a start time, right? Um, and I might not necessarily know where that, that uh, property is within the response. So one thing Connect gives you is a way to search. It's really, really cool. I know that I want start time. So I'll head up to the search option here and I'll type in start. In this case, I know it's end time. Oh. Item dot start time. And there it is. It collapses it down to just the information that I need, makes it really easy for me to select it. And now it's configured. Oh, configured three times. There we go. Now it's configured once. I will save it. Uh, one of the things Connect automatically does for you, which is really, really cool, is as you save it, it verifies that the configuration is, co is correct. That gives you the confidence as you build your flow to know that as you've designed that flow is as it's going to work. You're not going to hit anything unexpected if you're able to get this far within the step. Awesome. There's my calendar. There's all my events. I'm going to do one more thing. I like to... Uh, not have a big schedule. I'd like to clear it. Maybe I'll take the next week off. Um, so I'll do the same thing as the sync all events, but I'll do it in reverse. In this case, I'm going to run a flow that'll get my table definition, my sheet as we were. We're going to get all the records, and then I'm going to iterate through all the records and delete them. We'll call that my vacation time. I'll click run now. I'm going to let it iterate through. While it iterates, we'll take a look at the history. You see, okay, that was pretty fast head back to my studio calendar, and if all goes well, it should be blank, right? I can take some time off. Perfect. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much. I got at least one clap, right? I think my boss wouldn't clap at that. He'd be like, no, add the events back on, right? Okay, that was fun, but we've, we've got more work to do. Let's head back and... Oh. I'd like to introduce a quote that really resonated with me from uh, John Osterhaus. He was a professor uh, of computer science, he spent a really long time uh, studying the code of his students who later graduated with computer science degrees. He wrote a book called A Philosophy of Software Design, and this really resonated with me. He said, if software developers should always be thinking about design issues and reducing complexity is the most important element of software design, then software developers should always be thinking about complexity, specifically reducing complexity. And I would propose to you today that Connect, Claris Connect reduces that complexity. It allows you to abstract the complex integration logic that you have in your FileMaker scripts that's really hard to version, even harder to test, and move it into an area that's both easy to understand, easy to view, and then also easy to look at the history. Let's take a look at how that's done. So there are two ways that Claris Connect reduces complexity. I'm going to show you this, this flow here. This particular flow is a little bit more complex than we saw earlier with Studio. Uh, in this case, we're going to use the FileMaker trigger by script, and we'll go more into that, that trigger in just a little bit. We're going to get all our mobile devices from Jamf. We're going to iterate through it like we did earlier, and then we're going to create a record. The reason why this is interesting is that previously, if we wanted to do this with a FileMaker script, we'd have to construct the JSON, construct the curl, go through, make the call request, check it for an error, and if everything goes well, we're good. If not, we'd have to handle that error. I want to show you what that might look like uh, via a script. So here, I've got an empty FileMaker uh, app, which is designed for my devices, and I'm going to show you a script that I wrote, and I'll prove this to you in a second, uh, back in 2018, so just a few years ago, that allowed me to integrate uh, insert from URL and actually make an API call. This is very similar to syncing the MDM flow. Now, in this particular case, just to show you, this is done in 2018 because I leave comments. Um, I'm going to first go through, and as we all know, I'm going to set a, set a variable, which is going to be my script parameter. Then, because I want to make sure that I actually go through and I execute the script and it's going to work, I'm going to use a custom function, which I use, which is called json.validate.this, which makes sure that 
the script parameters that I send to my script is accurate. And I, so I set the variable of required parameters with the validation of all the rules that I have. I'll really quickly dive into this. See this here in this case. I need to make sure that I have a payload in my script parameter or I'm going to exit. Right. So there's some logic going on here. There's some error chopping that we need to do. We haven't even gotten to the API request yet. This is just firing the script. After that, I'm going to actually set the payload, the thing that I said needed to be there for the script to work. And I'll do that with my script parameter, use JSON get element uh, down here at line 25. And then I'm going to go through and I'm going to make the request, or at least I'm going to construct the request um, in the way that I need it. Um, in this case, because I love JSON and, and we all know it's super powerful, I'll use JSON to do that. I will use the JSON set element, and I'm going to create the method of post, the URL, the headers, and then some data, which was the payload that we required earlier. And now, uh, when I would do this, I wouldn't necessarily do the curl inline. Um, in fact, I would use a whole nother script to go through and actually make that request. So if you take a look at line 31 here, I'm writing the perform script, a whole nother script, a whole nother set of integration logic that I have to work through. And then I'm checking for the response of that script to see if it matches what I want. Uh, going through, and if I got a 401, you remember 401 is my bad, right? I did something wrong. Um, I'm going to exit out and let the caller of the script know that um, something happened. Or even more than that, I want to maybe do some error logic, right? I want to know that when this script fired, I need some logging that'll go through and tell me, hey, this script tried to fire, it called this API, and the API said, my bad, right? Um, and so for that, I have a whole nother script. I've got my log request script. Uh, and I'm going to write to that script anytime I actually get an error, right? So here's that script here. And that script is even more complex. There I've got uh, 58 lines of total code that I need to iterate through to just see if my request works. We take a look at how we would do that with Claris Connect, things become much more simple. Here's that same script, that same integration logic, but using the flow that you saw earlier. Here, I'm not doing any validation of the parameters because I can handle that in Connect. I am checking to see if the flow result happened because Connect will let us know if, if something went wrong. And then finally, just for the sake of the demo, I'm going to pause the script refresh the window, and if all goes well, we should see the devices populate. So this went from three scripts and over 100 lines of code to one script and 28 lines of code. This is much easier for me to deploy in other environments, much easier for me to version and test. Now, it's not to say that you should push everything over to Connect. There are some things that you probably want to do in your, your FileMaker solution. If you've already got an API that you've built, it's working, no need to change it. But consider when you move forward, when you run into those issues, when you're deploying the scripts, you need to update your credentials, potentially using Connect for, for that. Um, that'll give you logging, that'll give you versionability, which we're going to talk about in a second, that you didn't necessarily have to design, have to had before. Or if you did have it, you had to build it yourself. You had to do the manual work in order to catch the logs, in order to make sure the credentials are secure, but available to the API that's going to call the script, but not available to the end user because we don't want to give them credentials. Um, so overall, it reduces the complexity of that integration. Question. Is it possible to fetch the log results out of Connect and get them into FileMaker? That is something we're going to work on. If it's OK, we'll talk about that at the question time. Some of the stuff I'm going to touch on later on in the session may give you more information. I'm going to leave at least 10 minutes at the end for questions, maybe 12 if you're lucky. Um, so let's hold that for then. We'll get back into the, the details then. OK. So we went over the script. We kind of seen the difference between uh, the previous way that I would do it, these are scripts that I wrote, and the way that I would do it now using Connect. Let's do this and see uh, how it works. Pull up my FileMaker again. There it is. Uh, in this particular case, again, this is my FileMaker application. I've got a cool little icon in the top right corner that tells me I, I can sync. I'll hit the sync button. We'll give it a little bit of time. This is the time where everybody kind of sweats if it's going to work. And look at that. I've actually it's gone through. It's pulled the information from Jamf, and now it's automatically inserting it into my FileMaker app. Pretty cool, right? Pretty easy, right? We've reduced the complexity a significant amount. Let's go back and take a look at that uh, flow one more time. Um, I mentioned that uh, Connect would do kind of two things for you. Not only would it 
um, reduce the complexity of your Filmmaker scripts, allow you to offload it somewhere else, give you visibility via logging, but it also would help you move between environments. I want to talk about that now. When we, when we first started, I talked about app connections and how when you create uh, your project, you want to think about those connections and how they might play into your flows. Well, that's one area where uh, Connect will really help you with deployments. One of the big issues, one of the things we've all struggled with is where to keep those API credentials, uh, either in your FileMaker server or in your FileMaker file, and how to keep them secure. Well, with Connect, we make it really easy. We do all the securing for you. We do all the rotation. So if you've got an API key and you need to refresh that API key, say, every day, Connect will do that for you automatically. Um, if you, you want to use an app, an API that uses the OAuth2 flow, Connect will handle that OAuth2 flow automatically, even if you design a custom connector. Uh, and that's done in the app connections. So now that I know that my Calendly account works as it should, my FileMaker account works as it should, my Jamf account works as it should, and my FileMaker account works as it should, now that I've developed that, I want to move it into production. I want to either give it to my users or I'm going to use it myself um, in a way that we would consider in production. Well, to do that, all I need to do is go into the App Connections pane inside of Claris Connect and then choose the Reconnect option. I'll do this for Studio because it's easy to see, but this works for every uh, connector that you see here. In this case, I'll choose the Reconnect option inside of Claris Connect. It's going to look up my team for me, and I can really easily switch from Team Claris to Team Claris Engage 2022. Click Sign In. Oh. We'll pretend that that worked. Cool. Um, and it'll automatically switch for me. There's nothing I need to do to my scripts in order to make that work. It's all handled within, within Connect. Additionally, as I think part of the question that you had, we'll get to that in the end, um, was looking at when these, uh, what happens when the flow is executed. Let's say something happened in my FileMaker file, either something went wrong, um, I might then have to go into that FileMaker file in order to see the logs, the ones that I wrote myself. Well, in this particular case, I don't need to go anywhere but Claris Connect. It's available all the time, even if my file is offline, and I can see the flow history and each individual step within that flow. So that, again, allows me to reduce the complexity and gives me visibility into the integration that I didn't have before without, without a really heavy lift from my development side. The next thing I'd like to talk about is something really, really new. It's something I'm very excited about. I think as I walk through this, I think you'll get excited about it too, is the FileMaker Server Admin Connector. We all know that there's an admin uh, API that's available for FileMaker Server. Um, it's really, really cool. It's something that I used to use all the time. Um, but it does require the same thing. It requires API credentials. And it requires that you actually ha you make that API public in ways that maybe you don't want to. I'm thinking about the admin console here, how many people actually go through and make their admin console public? Not a lot, right? Nobody wants to do that. But you do need your admin console to be public in order to manage your server, right? Not with the FileMaker like server admin uh, connector. Connect can handle that uh, complexity for you. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Okay, to show this off, I've got another FileMaker file. Actually, truth be told, it's the same FileMaker file, but a different layout. Um, and this does two things for me. One, it allows me to send a message to my uh, FileMaker clients, ones that are hosted. And then later on, we're going to see that it actually allows me to manage my FileMaker server and make sure that when I want to do server maintenance or take the server down, take the file offline, um, everyone is aware of it, everyone's aligned, and the communication is done uh, automatically. So to show this, I've got a little video because I don't want to bring my server down in the middle of the presentation. And we'll run through this. So here I've got my FileMaker file, and I've got Slack. And part of the flow that I have here is when I actually request that the FileMaker file go offline, I'm going to message a Slack channel to let everyone know my development team that, hey, a request has been issued for uh, this server to go down. But then that's not enough, right? I don't necessarily just want folks to be 
um, requested that it's been issued, I actually want to get an approval for this. So what I'll do um, is I'll use the approval step, which I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, to send an email with the server details for the integration um, for approval. We'll see that pop up in just a second. There we go. There's my approval, pause it. Um, this flow actually pulls using the admin connector uh, the information about my server. I see that it's requested by FileMaker because it came from my FileMaker file. I can see the name of the server, which is very memorable, at EC2AMAZ, right? Perfect name for a server. Uh, and then I can also see how many clients. I can see that there's one active client where this went down. And one of the great things about this is I can actually send the email to either my customer or the IT administrator that manages the server where they can actually stop and say, hey, maybe we're okay and I can approve this email, which, which will cause the FileMaker server to go down. Um, or maybe they want to reject it and we'll wait. In this case, they chose to approve the email. So I get another Slack message that the request has been approved. And then finally, when the server has actually been stopped, I get a, I get a uh, message saying the server has been stopped. Let's take a look at that flow so we see the details of how it was created. Awesome. So the first thing that I told you was we wanted to message clients. Here's the flow for messaging clients. It's really only four steps, one step being the repeat utility. First thing I did was use the trigger by script step, which we've seen twice so far. We're going to see again later on. Then I got all my connected clients using the admin API, right? See everyone that's available or everyone that's hosted. I repeat through those clients and I send each one a message letting them know, hey, the server's about to go down for maintenance, save your work, take a break, grab some coffee, right? Um, and then after that, I can go through and do my next flow, separate piece of logic to actually uh, stop the FileMaker server. This one's a little bit more in depth. So we'll hang here for a bit and kind of walk through each individual piece. First thing we'll do is trigger by the script again, using the same integration with, with FileMaker. We're going to go into that again later on. It's really important. Um, then I use my add FMS channel to set what's called a flow context, which is essentially a variable, like we know a dollar sign variable um, inside, of, inside of FileMaker. I then go through and get the server information. So I have the things like the server name. I have uh, when it was put up online. Um, that sort of thing. I then get all the active clients, so I then can say, oh, there's one active client there. Or there's no active clients. So you're good to go. Then I use the Slack connector to actually go through and notify uh, my team that the request has been uh, made for the server to stop, so everyone that's on my development team is aware that something's about to happen. We can all be ready for it. Then I'll send out my approval, uh, which is what we started the IT administrator to say, hey, everyone's ready, all the clients are off, or in this case, one client was on. Do we want to move forward with this deployment? Do we want to move forward with the maintenance? If they approve it, or if they reject it, rather, I move to the if statement of if the approval is rejected. So I'm looking there if, uh, if the approval actually occurred. If it did, I notify Slack so my team knows, hey, stand down. We can't deploy the server yet. And then I stop the flow, right? So we don't actually go through and stop the server. Or if it was approved, as it was in the video, I notify Slack of the stop approval. So my team knows, OK, we're ready to go. Time to either take the server down, do an upgrade, do what we need to do. I close all the databases, I stop the server, and then finally, as the last step, I notify Slack that the server was instantly stopped. We, we're good to go. Two things I'll call out here, it's really kind of important. As we all know, closing all the databases isn't something that happens instantaneously. Stopping the server is also something that doesn't happen instantaneously. I've mashed that button a few times myself, right? Um, that's one of the powers of Claris Connect. It handles asynchronous logic really, really well. The uh, close all databases step won't happen until after Slack's been notified. Even more important, close all database, uh, the stop server step, number 12, won't occur before the close all databases happen. This makes things like asynchronous integrations much, much easier because you're just laying it out in a flow. As you think about it from a flow mentality, you're designing it here and connects handling the asynchronous parts, right? The difficult parts to handle. Awesome. All right. So uh, I only showed you a few of the actions that are available in the, uh, the FMS admin connector. Um, all of the APIs that you know of in the uh, admin API are available in the connector. 
Um, just to summarize a bit so you know where we're going, it abstracts handling the admin API credentials, right? I never needed to go to my server and actually grab the information, or I didn't need to put it in my FileMaker file in order to, to make the script. I use the, the triggers to do that automatically, again, abstracting that logic. It could also be combined with other connectors. In this particular case, I combined it with the repeat step that we saw earlier to loop through when we got all the clients. I used it with the approval utility, which sent an email and held on to the rest of the logic until the email was either approved or rejected. And then I used Slack to notify my team to let them know, hey, something's about to occur. Everybody should get ready. And finally, it provides all the actions to manage your FileMaker server. So it's really quite cool. OK. The next thing, I've mentioned it a few times, and I said, hey, we're going to wait till we get there. We're finally here. This is it. Uh, we're going to talk about the FileMaker trigger flow, the script step that allows you to trigger these uh, flows from FileMaker without the need for insert from URL. Before I go further, I want to say this again. There's no need to stop using insert from URL. It's great. I've used it all the time. If you've got an API integration that works, keep using it, right? If there's something that you need, if there's something synchronous that you need, keep going for it, right? It, it's a really great tool. I love it to death. The FileMaker trigger flow makes it easier, and it's going to continue to make it easier. So if you're interested in abstracting that logic, if you're interested in, in reducing the complexity for your application, let's check out this trigger flow. OK. So I'm going to bring back up my FileMaker file here. We're going to go to the script workspace, and uh, we'll use the close file script. That's the same one for the stop FMS deployment that you saw earlier, just to keep it together. And you'll notice that on 21, which I've got highlighted with a, a stop step, is trigger connect, Claris connect flow with the flow of the stop FMS deployment. That was the one that we saw earlier. Um, and in this case, uh, it takes a few uh, pieces of information. Let me highlight it to make it easier for everyone to see. I know I've got a tough time with it. Um, it takes parameters of the flow that, that I'd like to integrate with. It takes the JSON data, which in this case I'm going to call the flow context, which is anything that's passed to my script. Very, very similar to what we saw with uh, insert from URL when we constructed that payload. The only difference is when we constructed that payload uh, with insert from URL, we needed to include the method, we needed to include the URL, all the details that aren't really central to the integration, aren't really needed for what I'm looking to do. This simplifies that significantly. And then finally, one of the outputs that it has, one of the targets, uh, in my case, is the uh, variable of flow result. Before we move on, I want to show you some of the details here, because I want to go into a little bit more depth. There we go. Um, one of the great things about the uh, trigger, trigger uh, step is that it allows you to automatically pull any flow that you've got either integrated with a webhook or with the trigger script. So again, you can do both. You can either use the webhook or the uh, trigger by script uh, trigger step. Here are all the flows within that project that we saw earlier uh, that uses that step. We've used quite a few, so there's a few here. The message hosted users, that's what goes through and actually um, messages the users to let them know the server's about to go down before it does so. Sync MDM devices, which we saw earlier when we pulled the, the devices from Jamf. And then stop FMS deployment, which is what we just saw uh, a minute ago, which actually will go through and notify my team, like we saw. And then when everything is ready to go, take my server down. And a, a few others as well. Now, um, it's not just that, again, the trigger by script step can be used. Again, any webhook can be used. And, and that's kind of important. We're going to see this when we look at custom connectors. There are times that you actually want a synchronous response from your server, right? In the case of my custom connector, I'm going to use it to integrate some information from FileMaker um, to my custom connector, which is going to be uh, autopilot in this case. And I want to do something with the data when I get it back. That's the case where I'd use the uh, webhook. Because what webhook allows you to do is use what's called the respond with JSON script step. What that means is uh, it's connector is going to hold the response until all the steps of the flow are complete up to the respond with JSON. Again, we'll see this in a little bit. Um, and then give me back a JSON payload. So this script step can be used with either. You don't have to choose either not getting the information back or getting the information back. Do what you'd like the best. You can easily pick it from here. If you do use the 
Um, if you do use the webhook, one of the things that you need to, to do if you choose authentication is specify the app ID and the API key. That is how Connect secures those webhooks. When we get to the custom connector, I'm going to show you what that looks like. But just know that there's an additional step here that we need to do. If we're using a webhook and we want to secure that webhook, we need to provide the app ID and the API key in order to make that work. I'm going to call both of those out when we get to that flow. So the uh, Trigger Claris Connect flow automatically pulls up your flows, and then it, it will allow you to pass any JSON response to it, and will give you a, a response back of either OK or not OK. In my case, for my logic here, I do a flow result equal to OK as an if statement, and then if not, I exit my script with a uh, custom function for an error, which is quite, quite a common pattern. So using the FileMaker trigger flow uh, reduces the complexity of your FileMaker apps by removing the need to store API keys, as we saw earlier, right? We just selected the one we wanted and it automatically gave it to us. We can quickly shift between environments, as we saw earlier. If I have a flow that uses credentials for environment A and I want to switch them to environment B, all I have to do is go into the app connection and reconnect with my other account. All the flows that use that connection are automatically updated. There's nothing else you need to do. And then it provides scale that's really difficult to do with a FileMaker server. It's one thing that is always really complex to understand is, okay, when I start making these requests from FileMaker server directly, um, how do I make sure that I've got the speed, the CPU, the bandwidth in order to support that? Well, by using this script step, we'll handle that for you. Connect is designed for scale. It's designed to handle API integrations. That removes the burden from your developers to actually go through and worry about that sort of thing. It's something we abstract away for you. Again, reducing that complexity. Okay. Next thing I'd like to talk about, really, really cool, I mentioned it in the keynote, and that's custom connectors. Now, to date, Every connector that is on the Claris Connect platform was developed by us. Our engineers went through and, and designed it for you. And as we all know, that took a really long time, right? It, uh, folks have been waiting for connectors for, for almost ever, right? For, for years, if not more. Um, and those APIs tend to be unique, right? The API that you need may not be one that we're developing. Right? In fact, it may be a private API that we would never develop a connector for because only you have that information. Custom connectors allows you to go through and define those integrations as you need and with your expertise. Let's take a look at how those are defined. So we're back at the home screen of Claris Connect. We were in the My Projects pane before. In this case, I've skipped over to the Custom Connectors pane. You'll see that I've got a few here. Um, some that are published, they don't have the draft banner on them. Some that are still draft, I'm still working on them. They've got this blue draft on the right. Uh, just for simplicity, to start with, before we go into a custom one, um, I will go through and just take a look at Autopilot. I want to show you kind of what this looks like. So the connector is actually defined in JSON, right? The format that we all know, we all love. Um, and what it allows you to do is provide just pieces of information you need, and we'll fill in the rest for that API integration. Right? Rather than needing to code in uh, handling of OAuth 2 flow or handling of the API keys, you could just define, hey, this API key uses a custom header right, with a secret that's, uh, that's enabled. Or uh, this API endpoint is a get method, right? and that get method has uh, specific parameters that need to be passed in the URL right, as, a, as a path parameter. Um, all of that is abstracted away from you with the custom connector. All you need to do is define JSON. One of the things that we do to make this really easy is provide you with samples. Uh, we give you samples from a wide range of connectors, ones that we have internally, and these map a lot of the ones that we have internally, um, to give you a head start to get going. So if I know that my API uses the same authentication method as, say, uh, Clearbit or Autopilot, I could start with that and then modify as I need it, and I've already got a head start. I'm, I'm already uh, up and running. The other thing that we do here is we provide some automatic syntax highlighting and help hints to know where you might have been led astray. So here's my auth components. This is a, a very interesting one. Uh, in this case, I've got to type none, right? And let's say I go in and I say, I don't, want, I don't want type none. I actually want 
OAuth 2, right? Uh, it allows me to select it, and it tells me, yes, it's okay. But if you notice, now that I've done that, my auth components, it has an error, right? It's got a little squiggly line underneath it. Uh, most folks that have used uh, external IDEs know that that means that the, the linter, in this case, understands that something isn't right. Even further than that, we'll tell you what you need in order to um, make this accurate. So because I selected the OAuth2 flow, there's some additional information I need. I need the authorization URL, I need the token URL, I need a scope, I need a client ID, I need the client secret, I need the authorization params. The, the high, syntax highlight that we have here and the way that the connectors are, are constructed really minimize the amount of documentation that you need to understand in order to get up and running quickly. It's really pretty cool. The other thing that I might want to do here, let me put this back to none so it stops complaining at me. Uh, the other thing that I might want to do here is, again, abstract those credentials, right? I don't want to hard code them. I want uh, my team to be able to put in their own API keys so they're not all sharing one. They've got their own. Uh, but I want them to be secure. I don't want them to be accessible at the end user, and I might need them to be automatically refreshed. So in the top right corner here, you'll see I've got a secrets option, secret keys. When I provide the secret key, I'll put in here API underscore key. And I'll say this is super secret. Connect identifies that that is something that should be saved, secured, and in the case of all 2 automatically rotated. Um, and I can then reference that later on inside of my description. Uh, let me choose one that actually does that. As authfields.api key. So anything that I put in the secret keys are then reflected as authfields. The key of what I put in. I put in API underscore key, so now I can reference that automatically. Connect will replace that key as needed with the one that's configured uh, with the user. Okay, I'm going to stick with autopilot because it's a nice, simple example. Uh, I've got my secret keys defined here. Oh, not that one. I'll save it, and we'll move on to the, the next part of this the save and test. One of the great parts about custom connectors, just like the automatic linting that we saw, is we provide you with the ability to test directly in the environment, and those tests uh, give you responses in real time. So when I click the button, Connect's actually going to make that request and let me know whether or not it was successful, uh, and I can go back and edit it if not. So let me show you what that looks like. I'm going to pull up an API key that I have. Everybody, hide your eyes. Copy it over. If I'm quick with this, you might not see it. We'll blur it out later. I'll test. Connect looks at it. It says, OK, the authentication is accurate. I've got it. In seconds, I know whether or not it's going to work. But then even more than that, I have the request and response that I could see. OK, when this thing authenticates, it's going to give me a response back of my list information. It's going to give me a list of all the things that I have for autopilot. And I can also see the request that Connect made um, in order to make sure that that would work. So in this particular case, it sent a get method, no uh, query parameters, some headers with my key, um, and then also the URL and some timeouts. From there, I got a response, and I know that my authentication is going to work. Connect is going to handle this easily for me. Even more than that, uh, because I've defined the custom connector as JSON, I can go through and actually um, test out each individual action. Uh, in this case, I might want to add or update a new contact. And you'll notice here the contact is defined just like the field we saw earlier when we were defining our own uh, steps in uh, Claris Connect. Um, and here, let's see if my autocomplete works. It does. I provided some, some JSON information. I'm going to say I want to add or update a new contact, my name and my email. I can test this action as well. And if all goes well, I've got a check mark and I'm good to go. All right, so now I know that at least that authentication and that action work as needed. Now, I know that we're coming to close to the end of the session, so I'm going to move it along a little bit, little bit quicker. I won't test the rest of the actions. I will go through and create the connector. Connect says, OK, if I publish this, I'm going to make it static. And the reason why we do that is because we don't want someone to uh, accidentally update the connector and then have flows that are maybe used by someone else break. We really want to make sure that once you've defined a flow, it's going to continue to work until the external API changes, if that ever occurs. So once you publish the connector, you can't go back and change the definition. But you can copy that definition and just make a new connector. 
There's no limit to the amount of connectors you can make, and it's all just JSON. So it's easy to share, easy to copy, easy to update as you need. So yes, we're gonna publish it. Yes, after you publish it, you can't create a new connector, but you can easily go back and make a new one. No harm. I'll publish this and we'll really quickly look at the flow that uses this. And again, any, any team member can use any connector that's been published. Once it goes from draft to publish, be used in any flow in any project within your team. I'll head back to my projects here. In this case, I've got a uh, custom connector flow. This custom connector flow, just to do something a little bit different, uses the incoming HTTP request. It uses, in my case, the list starships option. It then goes through and creates a table based on the starships. Uh, it creates that table in Studio. What this is doing is actually saying, okay, from the custom connector, I want to define a table definition inside of Studio, right? That makes it really easy for me to integrate Studio with other uh, API integrations using Claris Connect, right? Um, where uh, previously we'd have to either copy in the table definition into FileMaker and make sure I've got all the fields correct and make sure that all the things align. Um, all I have to do now is use connect, call the connector, use the response from the connector, and I can easily use that response to create a table. We're going to automatically go through, and, uh, in this case, my list response ship, um, my list starships uh, API uh, connector has all of these fields. Based on those fields, Studio will automatically create a table for me. There's nothing else I need to do. Awesome. So just to summarize here, uh, custom connectors defined by familiar JSON schema. We've all seen it. We all love it. it makes it really easy to get up and run it quickly. We support both static and OAuth 2 authentication. Really, really cool. Authentication is something that we added, we added uh, recently, about a week and a half ago. It's there. You can use it. Love to get your feedback on it. And it also enables secure and scalable integrations without infrastructure overhead, right? As we said earlier, when you, when you did this within FileMaker, you had to be conscious of the, in, the performance impact on your server, right? If you're doing it from a server or the delay that might occur to a client when you make it from the client, right? In this case, Claris Connect will abstract that for you. You don't need to worry about scalability. We handle that on your behalf. Last but not least, it's built with an IDE that enhances development and testing. You get your tests in real time, you get real time feedback uh, of your definition and make sure that it's as you would expect. Awesome. Now I wanna take a second, you, you saw it in the keynote, uh, but I wanna go through it a little bit more in depth. We've got a, a little bit more time. Um, and that is the Claris Studio Connector. This is something that's currently available in ETS. Um, it is ready to go, we'd love to get your feedback. We're going to revise the functionality based on that feedback, which is one of the reasons it's still in ETS. We want to hear from you how this helps you and where we can enhance. Let's take a look at, oh, actually, I've got a slide. Uh, the Claris Studio Connector is one of the richest and deepest connectors we have. It has uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven triggers. We, two were added since I made this, so I had to count. Um, we, uh, those triggers allow you to do uh, uh, events like new record created, record updated, record deleted, and then also user events like a user was invited or user updated. From an actions perspective, there's over 60 actions. Anything you can do in Studio, and in fact more, can be done with the Studio connector. Right? We map Studio's uh, private API into actions and abstract away the authentication for you. So when you use this connector, there's no need to handle API keys, there's no need to handle authentication refresh, all you do is connect your team like you saw me do earlier, and then you're up and running, and you can use the connector as you need. Let's take a look at the demo, and then I will wrap it up with questions. Okay, we're gonna head back to our um, mobile device management app. Um, save all. I definitely saved something. Um, and in this case, we saw earlier that we could actually use uh, the, the Jamf integration with Connect and also the Studio Connector, which we saw earlier, um, to actually go through and pull in my devices. But what I didn't show you is the other thing this connector can do is actually go through and update, well, and update Jamf in real time. So as I make changes in my FileMaker file, Connect is automatically pushing those changes to Jamf, 
Just want to show you what this looks like. I've got my FileMaker file up here. Here's my device. Uh, let's say I wanted to change the name. Change, lose iPhone. Once I've made that change, I can take a look in Claris Connect. You'll see that it has now automatically started pending. So it's automatically pushed that information to Jav. And by the time we click on it, it's already done. So without needing to do any side of server-side scripts or anything native on the client, I just change that data inside of FileMaker, Connect sees it because Studio sent it to them, and triggers the flow and sends that information to Jamf. Makes it really easy to update uh, mobile devices in Jamf. Uh, Todd Weller, I, I heard in your session that you wanted to do that if you're here or you're listening. Take a look at this. I think this will give you what you need. So please uh, dive in, give me feedback. Uh, really quickly before we move on here, uh, I want to go into what the record update looks like, because it's kind of cool. What this allows me to do um, is take both the updated fields, in this case, the name of Lou's iPhone, and then also all the fields of the record and automatically pushes it to connect without, again, doing anything inside of FileMaker. So if we look at our step data here and we look at update description .update fields, .fields name, there's Lou's iPhone. And what that allows me to do is use Connect's logic to say, hey, the updated fields is the name. So I want to go in and update the device's name, or maybe the updated fields was my location. I'll update the location. Jamf uses two different APIs for that. So we use connect and the logical if statement to go between the two. Show you that just below. Yep, so here's my name is updated. It was triggered. I also have one for location is updated. Because we did the updated field, because we have that granularity, we stop that step, and this step isn't executing. Pretty cool, right? It's really awesome. There's no need for performance on server. You can still use it, but this makes it super, super simple. But there's even more, right? This, this connector goes even deeper than just data change information or user updates. Uh, one of the things that you, you heard from Peter in the keynote, you've heard from the product team, is we really want to unify the platform. And we know that there are times when FileMaker struggles to do kind of external things or slicing the data for an external team. The Studio Connector can help you with that. One of the flows that I have here is called create mobile device list detail. What this does, it's triggered by the uh, trigger step that we saw earlier. It's going to go through, it's going to get the sheet definition, the table information, if you will, uh, for my Jamf device. It's then going to get a specific sheet. So I know that I've got that table. That's the one that I, I want to use. It's going to create an app for me automatically. It's then going to create a view for me automatically and then publish that view so others on my team can see it. All of that is triggered from FileMaker. So we saw earlier, I've got my device. I changed the name. Now I actually want to publish it to my team so they can see the list of their devices without needing FileMaker. I'll click the share option here. That's going to run through a script. I'll show you the script really quick. Uh, it is going to you, uh, set the variable of data fields and list fields. So this is dynamically set within FileMaker. I'm saying exactly what studio properties I want in my view. I'm going to trigger the, the connect flow. And when I'm done, I get a mobile device list automatically created in Studio without the need to go through and actually do it manually. Right? This is a case of the platform actually FileMaker, Connect, and Studio all working together to give you a view that wasn't possible before without a lot of development. Cool. One more thing before I open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to show you something similar to what you saw in the keynote. I'll run through this really quick. Um, here I've got a task list in Studio. It's got a whole bunch of things that I need to do. I've got a lot on my plate right now. Uh, and I also have a FileMaker file that's got uh, exactly the same information, my tasks. And uh, finally, I have a uh, connect flow. Uh, what that connect flow will be called the uh, task automation. Uh, what it'll do is it'll, again, look for the record to be updated. Um, if the record came from FileMaker, it's going to post a message to Slack. If the record came from Studio, it's going to post another message to Slack. Really quickly, I just want to show you this so you get the sense of this working in real time. Here's a Slack uh, channel. I take a task. I move it from in progress to done inside of Studio. And I get a um, message inside of Slack saying, hey, this update occurred in Studio. Even cooler than that, I'll head down here into FileMaker. I'll move this task from in review to done. And I get an update inside of FileMaker. I can go back into Studio. I can change this task from to do to in progress. I get a message in Slack. 
I go down here to FileMaker. I can make a change from in progress to done. I get that message also in Slack. I, I think you're getting the idea here. Um, these are real-time updates. No processing needed on your server. All possible with the Studio Connector. Love to get your feedback. I'd love to hear more from you as you start to use it. Oh, lost the keynote. Uh, we are out of time. Before I go, though, I want to say I'm going right from here to the uh, Claris booth. I'm going to be there um, all day, so please come see me. Uh, if you have questions, you want to dive deeper into this, I'd love to talk with you about it. I'd love to see if this can help you, and we'll move on from there. Before I go, though, one more thing. Um, if you want to try out the Studio Connector, join Studio or uh, Connects ETS, scan the QR code, sign up. Um, love to get your feedback. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.